Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, whatever time it is. Um, I just finished ranting for an hour about stamps. Uh, before we begin, I understand the advertising class is canceled, so we have some advertising misfits drifting into this class. Who are you people? Put hands up. Everybody is in the religion course? Yeah. Okay, well, it helps me understand like where you're coming from. So, well, anyway, uh, I'm glad you're here today. All right, so let's go. Um, here's the topic, right? So last week, after the stamp class, somebody came up to me and goes, Oh, we're desperate. We, we have an empty week. There's nobody to talk. Would you come and talk? Well, I have nothing to say. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so they said to me, Well, what's the class? Right? Hope and optimism in religions of the world. So I'm like, no sweat, I got it. So all week long I've been tormented by this topic. I've been like tossing and turning and like obsessed with it. Hope and optimism in religion. You know, it, this is easy. So here we go. So this is what, I, and they said, well, do you want the PowerPoint? And I said, nah, we'll just put the chairs in a circle and talk about hope and optimism. I can make up stuff, I can wing it on that. Well, so I ended up doing a PowerPoint presentation, right? Because I've been tormented by this. Because I'm not kidding. I'm like, ruined my whole week, right? So here it is, right? Uh, so this is my church, and it looks this way right now. No, it doesn't. <laughs> this is St. Paul's Luther Church of Wurttemberg. Uh, it was founded in 1760. We're older than the United States. Isn't that neat? Um, and we have Revolution of War soldiers buried, you know, so I get to live in the country, a thousand dead people around me, and the truth is I get along better with them than I do the congregation. <laughs> so it's a great place to be. So we live out here in the country. Um, and these are some of the books that I wrote. You know, I wrote about Max Weber. This is the history. Of, this is a, mostly a local church if you're interested in the Palatine history, Palatine people. You know, it's all about that. And I spent, you know, I don't know, eight years writing it. It's an interesting book. Oh, and this book here, uh, it's out of print now. Can't imagine why. Uh, this is about apocalyptic speculation, which is going to come up with the topic today. Right? Apocalyptic speculation. Very interesting stuff. Right? Um, what's this? This is the CIA. Right? I've been teaching there for three or four years now. And what is it? It's, it's the CIA. We tap kegs, not phones. <laughs> I'm trying to get them to adopt that as a slogan. You know, a printed on the side. I was at in Oklahoma where my parents live, right? They live in normal Oklahoma. And what's that? Oh, you. Oh, you. You know, college football, it's like a cult out there. So I'm out there visiting, and I'm explaining to people, I teach economics at the CIA. And they're like, <laughs> you know, no, no, it's not the Langley one, it's the Hyde Park one, okay? So anyway, the CIA, I, I actually, I love this place. I've been an adjunct around here for like 20 years, and... I love the CIA kids. They're from all over the world, all over the United States, and they're blue-collar kids. A lot of the kids, are the, it's the first generation to go to college, and they're there for the chef and baking thing, but they have a bachelor's degree in business administration now. Fantastic. Because the CIA kids are not going to be making omelets in the back room. They're going to be managing like 15 restaurants. So, uh, and the bachelor's in business administration, it's just like the, when you get down the road at Marist College, $45,000 a year, room board tuition. Right? Except the CIA kids can actually do something productive. They can, you know, they have a technical skill. So it's the best of both worlds. It's the hands and the head at the same time. And I love these kids. You know, they're, I, I teach them economics, which is, you know, probably a bit dry for some people. But the kids, like, they come to class 15 minutes early. They're all prepared. They wear ties. The, I'm not kidding you. It's like, what is this? Am I dreaming or something? You know, uh, so I really like it there. So anyway, so I teach, you know, like, I'm in this ring right over here. Okay. Um, I was born in Minnesota. That's important because I'm a Lutheran. Okay. Um, these are my these are my ancestors. Right. They uh, they came from Norway. They were Lutheran. They had like 15 children, and I'm the offspring of this group here. And uh, where do they live now? They all left the farm, and they live all over mostly California and the West Coast now. I'm the only one that came east. Um, th this is me when I was baptized. So this is my, these are my parents who live in Oklahoma, and these are all Norwegian people. And this is uh, great-grandma Joshua, and her father was in the Civil War. So my great-great-grandfather is named Stephen J. Stevens, so I'm a member of the Sons of the Union War veterans. So I, you know, I'm, a, I'm a Civil War person. Here I am out in Oklahoma, you know, I love the Midwest. There it is. This is for me. <laughs> Mrs. Isaacs, she's from New Jersey. She's like this. <laughs> and I look at this and I'm like, oh, 
this is perfect, right? <laughs> Our kind of place, right? Right? And this is, I went to the Gettysburg Lutheran Theological Seminary, founded in 1832 on the battlefield. If you've ever been to Gettysburg, this is the old dorm building, and they use the cupola, both sides, to observe the uh, enemy troop movements. So this is Robert E. Lee up at Seminary Ridge. So, 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 and so here I am. So, I go there for four years, right? And I started when I was 31 years old, and so I, it was my lifelong dream to go to seminary, graduate school, and who are my professors? Well, are the, they, there are theologians who aren't German. They were all, all the, at the Lutheran Seminary, it's a very strange thing. It's like a time warp or a culture warp or something. Like, the professors are all German. And two of my favorite professors are World War II veterans. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, Gerhard Krodl was in the Luftwaffe. Oh. And of course, when you talk to Germans, they're, they're, they're always like, we were fighting the Russians on the Eastern Front. <laughs> yeah, I haven't met a German yet who says, we were manning the machine guns on Normandy Beach. <laughs> now, they're always on the Eastern Front. And my other, my other professor, um, um, uh, Eric Rich, he wrote 18 books on Martin Luther. He wrote so many books on Martin Luther, he, he looked like Martin Luther before he died. Um, he was a student of Professor Roland Baton at Yale. And so, German theology is really odd. Um, you ever hear of Schleiermacher before? Um, he's, a, he's a famous German theologian. He wrote um, a book called The Christian Faith in 1828. It wasn't translated into English until 1928. So there's like a wall, theologically speaking, where you have British and American people talking to each other. On the other side of the wall are the German theologians. So my brain, I, you know, basically I'm like a European that kind of washed up on the shore here. And Lutherans have this weird thing where the church I'm in now used to preach in German until like the 1840s because they were expecting the English people to learn German and come and be a Lutheran because that's the true religion. It's a very strange thing. The church I was baptized in, you know, back here, the picture there, 1955, in 1945, they were still preaching in Norwegian. So one of the odd things about Lutheranism that we, we expect people to learn Swedish, German, uh, Danish before you come to church because that's the God's language. God speaks German, everybody knows that. Right? So it's a very strange thing. So it's like a parallel universe, theologically speaking. Right? Um, Who is this? My email address is called ziggenfußu at juno.com. Ziggenfuss means goat foot in German. Ziggenfuss, Ziggenfuss. This is Henry Lafayette Ziggenfuss. And he, he fought in the Battle of Gettysburg. He was captured and he was forced to work at a Confederate field hospital during the battle. They were amputating limbs and stuff. He went on to become a Lutheran minister and his first church was in Rhinebeck, right? And he taught German. He, be, he became an Episcopalian priest, which was common in the 19th century. They would Episcopalians build churches in granite. Lutheran churches are wood, usually recycled wood because they're cheap, right? So Episcopalian. So he becomes Episcopalian priest. He built he built Christ Episcopalian Church in Poughkeepsie. Here we go. There, he built this. He built the building, right? And he's buried in Rhinebeck. So uh, he didn't have any children. So I'm I'm trying to keep the legacy of Ziegenfuss alive. Go ahead. A fair number of. Uh, Europeans, especially uh, after the failed revolutions of 1848, yes. of course, came here yeah. and fought in the Civil War. Yeah, that's right. A number of them on the Union side. Yeah, because they Germans knew that what disunion meant. And uh, remember, Germany had over 300 like duchies and counties and so on. They weren't unified until 1871. Yes. So a lot of the 48ers, uh, Karl Schurz is one of them, when they came over here, they fought on the Union side. Right, which is fascinating, right? Uh, anyway, so this is Ziegenfuss, right? Um, and of course, back to Gettysburg here very quickly. This is Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, right? 20th Maine. So I used to go to Little Round Top and stand around and try to, you know, suck up the vibes, you know? Uh, I really like him. He was a college professor who didn't know anything about military. He studied up on it, and he ends up winning the Congressional Medal of Honor. He died in 1914. Of what? Injuries sustained in, in the Civil War. Yeah, a bullet like went in here and nicked his bladder, came out the other side. So he walked around with a cane his entire life. He did governor of Maine three times, taught every college at Bowden, taught every course at Bowden College other than mathematics. You know, so he, I kind of like this, like he taught everything. And he, he'd be a guy like you'd really want to talk to. 
So he did the 20, he did this famous charge on done, done uh, save the day for the Union on the second day of the battle. Who's this? This is um, this is uh, this is a catechism uh, written by Frederick Henry Quitman. Invite me back some century, or I'll talk about John Anthony Quitman. You know the Quitman House in Rhinebeck? Ooh, thank you in advance. Very strange dude. Yeah. Um, his son, that's John Anthony Quitman. He goes to Mississippi and he owns 400 slaves. He's more Confederate and more Southerner than most Southerners were. He's born in Rhinebeck. Don't tell anybody that because they'll probably want to tear their eye out of the <laughs> Governor of Mississippi. So this is, this is Fred Equipment from Holly University, and he wrote this catechism in 1814. They almost built Hartwick College in Rhinebeck uh, because Quitman was going to be the systematic theology professor. He's the only Lutheran minister in America, American history, to get an honorary doctorate of divinity degree from Harvard University. So he's very highly regarded. Equipment. Uh, so that's Rhinebeck. Right. Here I am in, uh, in uh, Heidelberg, Germany. I wrote my dissertation about Max Weber. He died in 1920. Uh, we're still upset about him dying. Um, uh, and he wasn't home. I went to Heidelberg, he wasn't home, but his house is still there. Uh, here's Max Weber, a great guy. You want to read about him sometime? All right, here I am in Israel, uh, cave, number ten, uh, cave number four, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, you know, I took all these Bible courses at seminary. I love the Bible, it's fantastic. But then finally, I get to go to Israel, and I get to walk the turf. And what's odd about Israel, it's smaller than you would think. You know, in the Jesus movies, it's always like, you know, no, it's like, like everything's like really tight, small. Uh, and this is Qumran on the shore of the Dead Sea, 1,400 feet below sea level. How deep is the Dead Sea? I mean, how, how deep is uh, Death Valley? 280 feet below sea level. So this is like the lowest spot on Earth. It's absolutely amazing. And the barometric pressure is very high. It's dry, your sinuses are clear. You feel euphoric. I was like dancing around and stuff. It's a great place, right? So anyway, I love Israel. Here I am in, Is in India. Why do you want to go to Israel? The dental care, I mean, why do you want to go to India? The dental care is affordable here. This is a street dentist. <laughs> So you sit on a stump, and, and they like pull you to that for like five bucks. They have like a bucket, they throw the teeth in the bucket. It's a fantastic thing. So yeah, this is what it, and this guy is a third generation street dentist, and a great guy. I, I, we were like yucking it up, having a great time, so he's a good sport about it, you know. So yeah, this is why I go to the dentist. All right, ready? Here's the problem. The problem is we're talking about optimism and pessimism from a religious point of view. Okay, well, what is this all about? Most of us, uh, well, I'm talking to older people now. When I talk to the CIA kids, they're 18, 19, 20, guess what? They don't know what a newspaper is. They don't watch the news ever. They have no idea what's going on. It's amazing, right? They're like, it's like their own parallel culture, right? So for us, we watch the news. And what do we do? We yell at the TV screen. I do this all the time. This is Isaac Tasta like, oh no, he's at it again. I'm like, ah, yeah, don't you understand it's applied to me? You know, I'm always yelling at the TV, and no one cares about what I say. All right, so, so the problem is we have a daily we have a daily preoccupation with bad news. So you wonder why people are kind of pessimistic about things, right? Sometimes Mrs. Isaac says, "Turn it off. I can't watch the news anymore." Right? You know, it's like you watch the news. What is it? The Democrats think that Trump is Hitler and that he's corrupt. The Republicans think that the Democrats have compromised the CIA and the FBI, and therefore, I personally think that everyone is right. They're all evil, right? I mean, so you, you come away with these warped opinions. You get a distorted view of things when you watch the news, right? And what is it? If it bleeds, it leads, right? So again, they're not going to write a story about, you know, things are really looking up in Kansas. What a wonderful thing. No, they're always talk, they always interview some dysfunctional warp person, you know, like Jerry Springer show type stuff. That's who makes the news, right? So, you know, if you read this, you would think, you know, get the violent crazies off our streets, right? So, like, you would think that, you know, when I, when I go to work at the CIA, what do I do? I have armor plates welded on my pickup truck. And I carry weapons with me. I have to shoot my way out of the driveway. And there's, there's terrorist roadblocks along the way. They, no, we live in a pretty safe country. But you would never know that by reading the newspaper. We read the newspaper, we think, oh, it's horrible. Oh, terrible things. You know, all kinds of crime. Everything's going on wrong. So we tend to be pessimistic because, uh, and why does the news media do this? Well, they do it because it sells, right? They want ratings, right? You know, they're going to report on, oh, the economy is really doing well now. And, no, they're going to talk about all the horrible 
atrocities they could find, even if they make stuff up, right? So it's really interesting. So get the crazies off the street. If it bleeds, it leads. So again, this leads to like pessimism by a lot of people. Um, I like this one. This is probably a joke, right? ISIS lures lures women with kittens and Nutella. Nutella. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be willing to convert to Islam and be a terrorist just because of Nutella. You got to admit, right? <laughs> So this is the kind of stuff, you watch this and you're like, ah, the world's going to hell, there's no hope, what are we going to do? Stockpile weapons, right? Um, so here we go. Now, the movies that you people watch, you, you don't watch them, but my dopey college kids do, okay? Well, what do they watch? Well, remember this one? Yes. <laughs> Planet of the Apes. Remember that one? Right? Well, this is, this is an apocalyptic scenario movie, right? How about this one? Remember this one, The Day After? This was, um, this was, I think, in 1982, and it was the highest rated um, like miniseries ever on television in the 1980s before we had cable. And what, what happened? Somebody drops an atomic bomb on Kansas. Now, I've been to Kansas, and I know if you would do this, no one would notice. <laughs> but this is an apocalyptic movie, so it's like, oh, you know. So it's a big anti-war movie, apocalyptic scenario stuff, right? Um, and of course, the Mad Max series, right? This is a fantastic movie, right? It's like the most evil people ever put on film. You know, they have like mohawks and everything, and they're driving along, shooting everybody. So Mad Max is an apocalyptic scenario, right? Here's Mad Max, right? Um, and of course, well, this is my all-time favorite apocalyptic movie, miniseries and book, The Stand by Stephen King. You ever read this before? Yeah. It's, it's kind of a religious book, believe it or not. Yeah. And what is apocalyptic thinking? Apocalyptic thinking is black and white, good guys, bad guys, forces of darkness, forces of evil. And it leads to a, a crisis or an apocalyptic event, the second coming of Christ in Christian, Christian theology. So apocalyptic, so people think in apocalyptic categories, right? black and white stuff. So this is, uh, it's the Captain Trips virus that escapes from a government research lab and it kills 99 and 44 with 100% of the population. And he talks about the weird things that people do in apocalyptic scenarios. And he got a lot of this from studying the way people acted during the Black Plague. I predict that in 100 years, English literature courses, we're going to be reading Stephen King novels. Right? So a very interesting guy. So anyway, you know, so people read, so people watch this, right? Right. The stand, and this book in the um, in the uh, 70s and 80s had like a cult following. So like the big, like 1,500 page book, and kids would read that. Anybody read the stand? One? I can't believe it. You guys don't get out much. <laughs> the the mini series is really good. I mean, you, you, if you know, it, and it's Molly Ringwald is in it. And a cast of thousands, you know, with different, different actors. So you watch this series sometime, and then you're going to wonder. They, Stephen King's novels don't translate well to the to the big screen, right? They, they, it doesn't work. But in this case, the series is long enough that it actually works, and it literally it's the novel filmed. So you know, pretty interesting stuff. So it's apocalyptic scenario. That's what we're taking away. And of course, Water World. This is a great disaster film starring Kevin Cosner. Why was it a disaster? You lost more money than any movie ever made. It's a huge disaster, right? But this is an apocalyptic scenario where the world the world is flooded, right? We all have these end time scenarios, right? And day after tomorrow, this is a a huge freeze, right? Movie. Uh, I haven't even watched some of these, but they're literally. Maybe there's 50 or 60 apocalyptic movies a year being cranked out, and people watch this stuff. So, where do they get their religion or their theological worldview? Not from going to church or the synagogue or the mosque, right? So they get it from Hollywood. So they watch this stuff and they absorb apocalyptic scenarios kind of through the culture, right? Yeah, go ahead. But there's another word for this, and it's um, eschatology. Yeah, eschatology. Study of end times. Yeah, end times. Uh, angel was the last thing. This yes. Was. And angels and demons and the uh, second coming and that kind of stuff. Eschatology, apocalyptic scenarios, right? Um, so there's so these are secular apocalyptic scenario movies, and they're very popular among people. And of course, The Road, right? I talk to my my dopey CIA kids. I go, well, what are you reading in English? Well, they have them reading The Road, right? And what's The Road? It's an apocalyptic scenario where the world, I forget, some environmental disaster, and it's a survival, you know, survival kind of a thing. Uh, this is what the millennials read, you know. Uh, again, here it is, right? cannibalism, you know, worst case scenario stuff. 
I, I suppose the CIA kids are, are reading because they want to learn how to cope with human flesh. <laughs> you know, they, they, they make all kinds of interesting things in the CIA. Hey, what an outstanding casserole. Yeah, it's Jimmy. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you know, the gallows humor, you know? All right, so, and of course, The Walking Dead. This is, this is a post-apocalyptic scenario movie, right? And Mrs. Isaacs, she, she says, you're not watching that filth again. Get it out of my house. And she storms out of the house. I watch it because I have to relate to my daughter, Haley, who is a Seventh-day Adventist. She watches this movie. She's not supposed to, but she watches it. So we have interesting discussions about Nagin and The Walking Dead. You know, he owns the, the candy store in Linebacker, you know, the, the Nagin guy. He's like the arch villain. Um, so this is a, it's a post-apocalyptic scenario. And mostly it's about human relations. I try to ex explain to her that it's like a business management study. Oh, like kind of group allocated resources. And she doesn't believe it though. Right? Uh, and what the Book of Eli, this is another apocalyptic scenario movie. Right? You, you, can, you can do this for hours. We do a whole course on just apocalyptic scenario movies. Here, The Coming Ice Age. Right? Another one. 20, 2012. Well, I guess it's 2018. I guess it didn't happen. Alright? So, here we go. So we have all these apocalyptic scenarios out there, and we have this myth of the good old days, okay? And do we excel in this? Yeah, I live in Rhinebeck, right? What's well, Rhinebeck? Oh, it's a quaint Victorian village. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have to restore the Victorian house. And, yeah. Well, people like me, if I lived in Rhinebeck, I'd be one of the serfs working on the estate down by one of the river people, right? <laughs> so believe me, you wouldn't want to go back to quaint Victorian England in 1880 or something, right? Uh, so the good old days are really a myth, right? And why? Because we tend to forget the bad and evil things that happen to us in life, and we tend to think about the good things. Right? You know, people talk about World War II, right? Well, World War II, 50 million people died, but then people talk about, oh, Glenn Miller, you know? You know, the, the Andrew sisters, oh, Frank Sinatra, you know, they, they, we tend to talk about the good stuff and forget the bad stuff that happened. And, then, and we tend to romanticize the past. Romanticizing the past is a really dangerous thing, right? Um, so, yeah, here, this is, I don't know about your family in the 50s, but this is my family, right? <laughs> the perfect family in every way. So, so we look at this stuff, this is like, you know, so we said, oh, if we can only, you know, go back to 1957, the world would be perfect. Well, I don't think any folks would want to go back to 1957, <laughs> right? Well, why not? Well, like, black people drink out of the separate fountains, there's a lot of repression going on. Uh, it was not the golden age of the human race or something, right? Um, yeah, here we go. Father knows best stuff, right? You know? Um, right now, I'm, I'm watching this thing on cable. It's me TV from Middletown, New Jersey. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Perry Mason. So there's 278 Perry Mason shows. I watch this. Mrs. Isaac, we watch this together. We drink the hot chocolate, you know, with the poodle dog. It's like, so watch Perry Mason. What's great about Perry Mason? Well, the guy wears a suit all the time. <laughs> and Paul Drake wears a suit. And Della Street, she looks great. And everybody's like all dressed up and formal. And it's all great. And they're like, wow, what a great thing, right? And he knows. And he always wins at the end. And people's always punished and stuff. What a great show, right? So, so the 1950s, right? So don't romanticize the past, right? So here you go. You make a list, right? Optimism and pessimism. On the pessimism side, we have despair, sad, half-empty, gloom and doom. Okay? We have a lot of people that, that, that think this way, right? Again, they watch the news, they watch the apocalyptic movies, or you have people that are optimistic. Hope, glad, half full, blue skies all the time. You know, optimistic people, they get in the car and they go down Highway 9. And what happens? Every stoplight between here and 84 is green. It takes me like three hours to get down there, but they can do it in like 10 minutes. Right? Right? So the optimism and pessimism. See, I believe in God, and I'm, I'm pretty, much of a pest, uh, pretty much of an optimist because I was born in Minnesota, and my ancestors are farmers. So when we call out my mother, we say to her, well, how are things going? Good, things are fine, right? Everything is always good. They're always like, no matter what happens, you know? They're always pa passive, they're always optimistic, right? Well, I'm an optimist, and I married Mrs. Isaac. She's from New Jersey. <laughs> she would be on this other side of the column, the pessimistic column, you know? So she, she tells me I'm going out to Kansas to visit, right? And what does she say to me? She says, don't talk to anybody. Because you're too friendly. If you talk to people out there, something bad's going to happen. You're going to be killed, raped, murdered, you know? So don't talk to people. So I go out to Kansas, 
And then people think I'm weird because like, they're like, how are you today? And I like run away from them. <laughs> I listen to what Mrs. Isaac says because she's in New Jersey. She's skeptical about this stuff. So we have pessimism, we have optimism. So there's two kinds of people. And God in his wisdom seems to have put optimistic and pessimistic people together as spouses, right? So we can torture each other and it's be done. And it's a fantastic thing, right? Right? Um, all right, so I like this one here. Ready? Remember the hee-haw, right? Gloom, despair, agony, deep, dark depression, excessive misery. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Right? Hee-haw. Right? So, so this is like the gloom, despair, and agony song. So Mrs. Isaac sings this song a lot, walking around the Parsons Gym Morning. We sing this song. Gloom, despair, and agony, right? All right? And then the alternative is Norma Vincent Peale, right? Theory of uh, 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 positive thinking, right? Power positive thinking. Uh, from Pauling, right? He lived right down the road here. And he's a remarkable guy, power positive thinking, right? Um, so you have like two poles here. I, I like this one, the optimist versus the pessimist. The pessimist says, oh, gross, they're ants on my pizza. And what does the optimist say? Hey, look, free toppings. <laughs> <laughs> this is fantastic. This is like the greatest thing ever, right? <laughs> so, so this is Mrs. Isaac. Yeah, 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 you know. I'm like, hey, free topping, right? I got the CIA, they teach you to eat all kinds of disgusting things, and you like it. It's called French food, right? <laughs> all right, so here we go. So we have optimistic people, pessimistic people, and we have realistic people, right? So I would put myself, I guess, probably in the realistic camp. I try to look at the facts, and they try to make an assessment from there. Right? So I'm not, like, naive. I get a lot of times people who are religious, you know, oh, everything is fine. God will take care of it. Jesus loves you, all that kind of stuff. Well, that's kind of, you know, when you're going through some calamity, you don't really want to hear that stuff. So, so sometimes religious people are hyper-optimistic, sometimes people are pessimistic. Well, I try, to, I try to be in the realistic camp. All right, ready? Quick, this is an instant Lutheran theology. We'll take like two seconds to go through this. Lutherans are, we believe in uh, um, the creator-creation dichotomy. What does that mean? That in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and we're creatures on this side. Creator, what's the first commandment? Thou shalt know the gods before me. Okay, so creatures worship the creator. Okay, that's called that's called theism. Okay, so here I'm going to teach you a little Greek here. Ready? Theos means God means God or the gods. Theos means God or the gods. Ah means no or negation in Greek. So ah theos means what? Atheist. No God or gods. So an atheist doesn't believe. Not just you deny Christianity or you know Jewish or Islam, but they believe in no god or gods. Okay, uh, polytheos. Poly means many, many gods. Polytheism. So you can do the hand sign like this: theism, right? Polytheism, many gods, right? Pantheism is this, right? One, the, uh, all is God. God is all. That's called pantheism. Okay, and monotheos, one god. Right. So Christians are monotheistic. And I like this one, ah, gnosis. Uh, no, gnosis means like not secret knowledge or internal knowledge. Ah means no. So an, an agnostic person says, no, no. I don't have enough information to render a decision one way or another about God or the gods. Ah, agnostic, okay? So these are some you know, basic words. There are three monotheistic religions. We live in New York, you have to know about the five world religions, right? It's like this. Judaism, Christianity, Islam, take a breath, Hinduism, Buddhism. Okay? So the five world religions, why do you have to know that? You live in New York. So you have to know, you know, if you have a nice Jewish neighbor, here's a ham. I know it's the new year, we want to have some ham here, you know, that's probably not a good idea. So out of respect for your neighbors, you need to study the five world religions. You don't have to believe any of them, but you have to know what other people's religious customs are so you don't insult them, right? Uh, so we live in New York. So Judaism, Christianity, Islam. So I'm coming from the Christian perspective today because I'm representing the Lutheran. So what do you do about this? All right. First of all, in the Luther course, we spent seven weeks on this, right? What, what did we learn? We learned one thing. Martin Luther King Jr. did not found the Lutheran Church. This is what I do. They, they, me, they look at me and they know me for a long time and they finally work with the courage. Do you have a lot of black people in your church? Well, I wish I did. Why do you ask that? Well, did Martin Luther King, and like, please kill me. I can't tell you. So, Martin Luther, 500 year old guy, German guy, fat German guy, drank a lot of beer. That's him. Okay? So, we have the Latin West and the Greek. So, Greek Orthodox is a whole domain. You know, Greek Orthodox, Serbian Orthodox, Armenian Orthodox, that's a whole uh, domain in itself. 
and they split from the Latin Catholic Church in 1054, and the Greek Orthodox people are waiting for the Catholics to come to their senses and return to the true church, which is the Greek church. It's amazing, right? Um, so who are we? Uh, Lutherans, Protestant Reformation, 1517, and uh, so we're, we're basically refried Catholics. Do we understand Catholic theology? Yeah, we're like the cousins of Catholics, right? Calvinism is its own uh, odd thing. Most American Protestants are Calvinists of some type or another. They're not Lutheran. Lutherans are weird. We're like not, we're not Catholic and we're not Calvinist. We're kind of in between. We're waiting for people to learn German so they come to our church. <laughs> so well, like, Lutherans are not, you know. All right, so sola scriptura means Bible alone. So how do you do theology? You say, you don't say, I have a very interesting opinion. Well, thank you, shut up. Right? You, you, you do theology by what does the Bible say about a given uh, issue or subject. So if we're talking about optimism, pessimism, I have many interesting opinions, but if you're doing theology, it's what does the Bible say about it? Sola Scriptura. Okay? Um, how do you, okay, I don't have time to read the Bible. I'm busy, you know, so I'm taking courses at Bard or something. So here's what you do. Here's the whole Bible. The creation, the fall, the redemption. One, two, three. So the creation is Genesis 1 through 3. Genesis 3.15 is the fall. Sin and death entered the world. The world screwed up because of the fall. And the rest of the Bible from 3.15 on is the story of how God redeemed or saved the world. That's where apocalyptic stuff comes in. Okay, so it's three. Creation, fall, redemption. Okay? Um, so, Christian social ethics. Lutherans, we're not like Catholics. Catholics have like a, a paper the Pope said it, therefore it's true. It, with Lutheran social ethics, we like to get together and drink coffee and eat bratwurst and discuss things. Maybe some beer might be involved. So it takes like three to seven hours and several pints of beer and coffee and donuts to settle anything. And we, even then, you don't settle it. So basically, you're saved by grace through faith in Christ, not by works of the law. Justification. Sanctification is the realm of Christian living. So that's Christian social ethics is on that side. Because you're a Christian, therefore you do this. See that? So there isn't like, what's the Lutheran view of abortion? What's the Lutheran view of gay marriage or something? We don't have an official uh, dogma. Instead, it's what would, what would Jesus do? Or because you're a Christian, therefore that happens, right? So Christian social ethics, that's what we're talking about today. So things like law and order, just war theory, three-hour lecture, human rights, human rights, I, I don't get me going. Uh, wealth and poverty issues, environmentalism, these are all Christian social ethics functions. 